<laughs> All right, we're now recording uh, as well. Recording is much better than that's uh, streaming. Don't worry, it's going to be. Yeah, I'm going to put that on as well because you look a little bit dark. So, Otherwise, we can't see you, Carl. Yeah, maybe that's fine. Maybe this is it. All right, thank you. I think we're. I don't need this. <laughs> <laughs> Taking over your lecture. I think we're live to the world, so thank you for coming along, everyone. This is kind of a natural follow-up to Danielle's lecture uh, we had a few weeks ago. I think most of you came along for that. So it's the <coughs> third Anita lecture of the year, and the second uh, to ICRA. So Cullen has kindly volunteered to carry on talking about correlations and particularly power spectra. And I believe towards the end you're going to get into applications uh, to cosmology and these sorts of things. Uh, yeah, a little bit of it. A little bit of that. Some Good. Examples. So, uh, yeah, we'll have the slides. So don't worry if you can't quite see everything if you're watching, particularly the live stream, I guess. Because um, we'll put the slides online and the hosted video is going to be a better quality recording as well. So when you watch it back, you, you should be able to resolve everything. So don't panic uh, if you can't see all the equations. I'll let you go. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thanks everyone for uh, turning up, and I apologize in advance, there will be quite a few equations. It's, it's both Fourier statistics and, uh, and cosmology, so you've got the worst <laughs> combined there. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about yeah, correlations, power spectra, and uh, a little bit about uh, Gaussian random fields as well uh, to start off with. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll just go over an intro to Gaussians, so I'll start off with something that hopefully will sin, which is a Gaussian. Um, and then I'll use that to introduce covariance, and then from covariance we'll go to correlations and correlation functions. Um, I'll give you sort of a general overview of those and how they can be used in astronomy. Uh, I'll primarily focus on uh, large scale structure because that's what I work on, but these things should be you know, transferable to a wide number of uh, uses in astronomy. And then how we estimate them, um, and then from there I'll go on to power spectra. Um, their relation to the correlation function, again, how we can estimate them, and some important caveats. Um, and then from there, we'll go beyond two point statistics right at the end, so that there won't be too much detail there, but we'll just say, you know, this is only the tip of the iceberg uh, when it comes to these things. Um, so, to start with, this is a Gaussian. I'm pretty sure you've all seen this before. You can characterize it by its mean here and uh, its variance. Um, and so, for instance, if you've got a bunch of measurements, you often we'll, we'll assume that they're described by a Gaussian with some mean and some error. Um, and then the, the Gaussian itself has a, a bunch of useful properties, uh, which makes it ideal for, for sort of an assumption, um, if you don't know what the PDF is. Um, for instance, it's fully described by its first two uh, cumulants, that's the mean and the variance, you don't need anything else to describe it. Uh, that's not true of many other functions, you can imagine any number of functions which you need some skewness or some kurtosis to describe as well. Um, this is quite a cool thing I found out the other day. It's infinitely differentiable, which means it has a smoothness of two, supposedly. So um, that's another uh, very good property of the Gaussian. Um, it has a very nice Fourier transform. Does anyone know what that is? Gaussian. It's a Gaussian. Correct. Uh, also, if you take two independent Gaussians and you convolve them, what do you get? The answer is a Gaussian, <laughs> right? Um, and so, what makes this really interesting as well for use in sort of especially cosmology and uh, astro uh, astronomy and astrophysics in general, is a central limit theorem. And this says that if you take a bunch of independent random variables with some finite expectation of variance, and then you add them, there's some tends towards a normal distribution as well. Um, and that's independent of the, original the distribution of the original variables themselves. So they can be any distribution, but given enough sums, they'll approximate a Gaussian. Um, and so just a quick sort of demonstration to show this, I've, uh, here I wrote a short code which would just roll a dice uh, a million times, and it's a good thing I did it in Python because I don't have the time to do that in real life. Um, and so you can see that, you know, given a million rolls, the chance of getting a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6 is pretty, pretty standard, it's, it's pretty uniform, but I haven't used a weighted dice here. But then if I split this up into a thousand sets of rolls, so I've got a thousand times a thousand rolls, uh, and then take the average, then if I take one, uh, so the average just my first set of thousands, then I get you know, some average size number. And then if I do it for two, I get this. And eventually, by almost magic, this distribution will start to look like a Gaussian. So once I've averaged over 500 sets of 1,000 rolls, then the distribution of those averages is look, looks like a Gaussian. Um, and so this is the central limit theorem in action here. Um, and this means that, you know, even if you haven't got any other knowledge about the statistics of your field, 
uh, a Gaussian is a very good assumption. Um, but what about if you've got more than one variable? And then, then you can generalize this Gaussian to the idea of a multivariate Gaussian. So instead of having just a single variable, I now have two variables, which may be independent, or they may be correlated in some way. Um, for instance, you know, an example here could be, say I've measured a bunch of apparent magnitudes on the sky, and I also know the seeing on the sky. Are these things independent? Are these things correlated? Um, and so what you could do is to describe those two things, is you could say, well, I now assume there's a multivariate Gaussian between these two. Um, and just like the normal Gaussian, um, so just to, this looks very similar to normal Gaussian distributions, but instead here you've got this covariance instead of the standard variance. And here you've got this one well term, which I call chi squared here because that's what most people know it as. But it's just basically the difference between your data and the mean and then the covariance. So if you've got, you know, in one dimension you just have data minus mean over the error uh, squared. And, you know, for this case here, it's, we've got two dimensions, so it's a two-dimensional uh, two multivariate Gaussian. So you can say, you know, you've got these two variables, x and y. They've got some mean, you know, which is roughly centered on zero. Um, and then they have this covariance matrix, which on the diagonal is the, the variances of those two uh, variables. But on the off-diagonal, encodes the, the covariance between those two variables. And so just like a single uh, dimensional Gaussian, the multivariate Gaussian is fully described by its mean vector and its covariance matrix. Um, so this is the definition of covariance. So you basically got the, the variable at i minus the expectation of the mean at i, uh, and the, the variable at j, and the expectation at j as well. Um, and so if you then propagate this through to a, a single case, you end up with you know, xi minus mu i squared, which is just the variance. Um, and then from that, we can define a correlation matrix, and this is where I'm gonna be getting to in a minute when we move on to correlation functions and power spectra. And that simply is just defined as a covariance matrix divided by the diagonal elements square rooted. So for that two-dimensional case we just looked at, then you can say, well, once you've normalized it, I've normalized out this x squared term here, uh, sigma x squared term, sorry. I've normalized out the sigma y squared term here. And all I'm left with is just this correlation coefficient between the two. So hopefully you've all done something like this in the past, um, either during or uh, undergraduate or masters. Um, and this brings us nicely to the idea of a correlation function. So from uh, the covariance and the multivariate Gaussian distribution, we can define a correlation function, um, which represents not just the correlation between two sets of variables, but represents the correlation between two random variables at different points as well. So it's sort of an extension to the, to the correlation matrix in, in that sense. And so here I've written the correlation function here between two fields A and B. They can be any, any field you want. Um, and although this looks a little complicated because there's so many brackets going on here, um, basically all this is is this is just the covariance between a field A and a field B, but now at point X and point Y, so not necessarily at the same point, uh, uh, divided by the, the variance in those two fields. Um, so this is the general case. This is technically the cross-correlation function between two fields A and B. But a much more common to, sort of thing to look at is the autocorrelation function, which is if you replace this A, this B here with A, then now what you're looking at is you're taking your field and you're looking at how what different points in those fields are correlated with each other. Um, so you know, uh, the, the, the value of that field at X and the value for the Y, uh, at y um, how they're correlated. Um, and so in the same way that a Gaussian random field is completely described by its mean and its covariance, it can also be completely described by the correlation function. Um, and I'll come back to this right at the end um, because this is very useful uh, in terms of you know, the real universe. Um, and so this is why we might want to try and measure the correlation function. Because if we know the correlation function of our fields, we know the mean of our fields, then we can perfectly describe the distribution of that field. Um, so there are a few symmetries in this correlation function which uh, come in very useful. So if our field has translational symmetry, which means we can move it from here to here without changing the properties of the field, then you can change the correlation function from depending on the position of x and the position of y to instead just depending on the difference between these two. So for instance, in this case, the correlation function, if, if my field is translational, I can translate it, translate it without uh, changing the properties, then it doesn't matter whether my x is here or my x is here, because my y will be here still. So all that really matters is the distance between these two points. Um, on top of that, if it's also got rotational symmetry, then 
the difference between the two positions is not that relevant anymore. And in fact, all that really matters is the, the sort of the distance between those two instead. Um, so this is a combination of translational symmetry, which, re which sort of reduces this correlation function to just the separation between the two vectors. And then rotational symmetry just means that it doesn't even depend on where those vectors are. It just depends on the magnitude of the difference between the two. So this is extremely useful in astrophysics because there's lots of times where we think you know, we've got fields which may be uh, both translationally and rotationally invariant. Um, and so for instance, here's, uh, so what the correlation func function does overall is for a statistically homogeneous and isotropic field, which means that it's invariant if you translate it or you rotate it, um, so it doesn't matter where you are or, or which direction you're looking. Um, it describes the probability of finding two, operated, uh, two, two uh, observables or objects separated by some distance. Um, this can also work in time intervals as well. It doesn't have to be sort of two things which are separated in distance. You can also say, well, if I take a measurement at this time and I take a measurement at this time, are these two things correlated? And so you can imagine, you know, there'll be cases where you do that for pulsars, for instance. You can look at the, the, the correlation between pulsar frequencies and times. Um, the example I've got here is you might want to look at how the sort of the position of star forming clumps uh, in the center uh, uh, are, are correlated with respect to the center of the galaxy. So you know you look at the correlation between the dis this, this distance here and the correlation between this distance here and this distance here, and you could build up a correlation function in that way. Uh, alternatively, you could try that with sunspots. Um, you could say, well, what's the correlation uh, between the locations of these sunspots on the sun? Um, you know, you could also say how are these correlated to the strength of the magnetic field at these positions on the sun. That would be a cross correlation function. Um, and so the one that I'm going to tell you about today mainly is the correlation function we use in cosmology, which is how the positions of galaxies, so in this image here, every dot represents a galaxy, uh, how the position of galaxies are correlated with respect to each other. And it turns out that that has a lot of information uh, in it. It tells you a lot about the underlying field. And, you know, if the field is Gaussian again, that will tell you everything about the distribution of these galaxies. Um, so here's, uh, now I'm going to go into a, a little bit of an example uh, on how to compute correlation functions. Uh, and I'm going to stick with galaxy clustering for this example, but this is by no means uh, the only case where you can apply this. You can apply this to any, any case where you want to look at the correlation between two things. Um, and for a good reference, I'll come back at the end, this is, is a people's textbook from 1980, which you know, is now 40 years old, but is still sort of the benchmark for understanding all this stuff about correlations. Um, so here I've got a galaxy, well, I'm not actually sure this is a galaxy field, we'll pretend it's a galaxy field. Um, you know, you see you've got all these galaxies uh, com uh, composing the large scale structure. Um, and I want to say, what is the probability of finding a galaxy here in this tiny sort of cubic uh, infinitesimal volume? So I shouldn't have to convince you too much that the probability of me finding a galaxy in this tiny volume here is just the total number of galaxies in my whole volume divided by the volume times by this tiny volume here. Right? Um, so this is just sort of the number density of galaxies, the number per unit volume, and I'm multiplied by this tiny volume. Um, so now what happens if I say, instead of wanting to find a galaxy at a single point uh, in, my, in my field, I want to find two galaxies within my field separated by some distance. Uh, so now we have to consider what the probability is of finding a galaxy here and finding a galaxy here. And like I said earlier, this doesn't have to be galaxies. This could be spots on the sun. This could be, uh, you know, this could be star forming clusters around uh, the center of a spiral galaxy. Um, and so for a random distribution, this is quite easy. You know, it's basically what's the probability of finding a galaxy in here times the probability of finding a galaxy in here. So you can say that the probability of finding a galaxy in both of these things is just this m bar, which is now the number of galaxies divided by the volume times by the size of the tiny volume here, times by this tiny volume here. And then, but if these two things are correlated, this is no longer the case. And instead, if they're correlated, then we can say that this, the chance of finding a galaxy here and a galaxy here is the same as a random distribution, but then multiplied by the excess probability above random, so the correlation between these two things. Um, and if you look at these two equations, then you can kind of see a really neat way of calculating the correlation function here. Um, and basically the way you can do that is you can just count you know, how many galaxies are separated by distance r, and this will give you, you know, this. And then you can divide that through by how many random points would be correlated. 
uh, or what we found out that distance are. And you can, so you can see, if you naively just divide this by this, you get the one plus, one plus uh, the correlation function here. And so that's what we do. Uh, so here I've just written an estimator for the correlation function. So here, basically, we've set up our data on a field. Uh, I've generated a random field, which you know matches the same coverage as the data, but I haven't positioned the points anywhere. I just chuck them randomly down on the field. Um, so if you basically count how many there are separated by, this, by some distance in your data, you do the same for your random fields, and you minus one, you've got a correlation function. Um, and so here's, you know, this is super simple stuff. This is, this is an example C code for this. So I've taken a bunch of galaxies. I just loop over all my galaxies, and then loop over all other galaxies other than that one. I then say what's the distance between those galaxies. So that's what this dx, dy, dz is. I can find the distance between the two. You know, and I've been, and I say this is what my DD count is. So this is this here is nothing more than just this DD count here. And then you do the same to your random field. So now instead of looping over all random galaxies, well, over all galaxies, sorry, I'll loop over a bunch of random points, which are also situated in my field. Um, and so that's that's one way you can estimate the correlation function. So ideally, in order to reduce noise in this estimator, you want as many random variable, uh, random data points as possible. Um, so you know you could have a thousand galaxies or a thousand sunspots or a thousand points, um, but you want as many random as you can. So you might have a million random points scattered across the surface. Um, but then what you need to do is you need to, need to normalize. So what I've done here is I've just normalized by the number of galaxies uh, or the total number of galaxy pairs you could ever have, which you know just by combinatorics is n galaxies squared minus n galaxies over two. Uh, it's the same for the random points. And so this, this normalization factor here is just the number of unique pairs you can get um, if you've got you know, a list that you're looking over. Um, however, you know, this, this is the estimator that you can come up with just by thinking about, what, uh, about what, how things are distributed with respect to each other in tiny volumes. Um, however, it's not the perfect estimator um, because it's both biased and it has, uh, it's not the minimum variance estimator either. Um, and in fact, so these, uh, this paper here from 1993, uh, in the context of galaxy clustering, came up with this estimator, um, which does a better job in that sense. Um, so this has now got much better variance properties than the previous estimator. Um, and, and, and in fact, I think the variance of this correlation function now much more accurately uh, represents a, a Poisson distribution, which is what you'd expect for these DD and R accounts because you're just summing over points. So you'd expect them to have Poisson error fields. Um, and the while this may look slightly different from the previous estimator, I mean, we've got to consider the fact that this is still uncorrelated. That this is the data and random. So this is now the cross correlation between the data and random fields. This is, these two are uncorrelated. You know, the random random should be uncorrelated. So, you know, you've got two of this plus one of this divided by this. So it's not any different really um, from, you know, just DD over R minus one. Uh, but the variance properties of this estimator, because you're including this factor here, uh, are much better. Um, and so again, if you wanted to compute the correlation function for your your observable of choice, whether that's you know gas clustering or sunspots or star cluster, uh, star forming regions inside a galaxy, you can use this estimator to calculate that correlation function. Um, so the other thing I mentioned is that this is not just uh, that previous estimator is not just the minimum variance estimator, but it's also biased. And the reason it's biased is because we have to estimate the mean number of galaxies from our data. Or you have to estimate the mean number of sunspots on the sun, or the number you expect, you'd expect on the sun from the data. And so what this does is this gives you something called the integral constraint, um, which is this bit here. And so this is just the average correlation function across your full set of data. Um, so the simplest way to imagine this is if you've got a galaxy field and you've got your galaxies just in a patch, you haven't observed the whole sky, then the fact that you haven't observed the whole sky means that you're getting this integral constraint. So this just basically drops out from the fact you have a, a survey mask. Um, and this would also drop out if you had you know, patches in your, in your data, in your galaxy, for instance. Um, so that is how we estimate the correlation function. This has been done now for you know, nearly 40 years now. Um, and this is, uh, at least in larger structure, and this is, uh, an S this is what the correlation function is for Galaxy, yeah, galaxies in the universe. So this is taken from SDSS, uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey data. Um, 
This is basically the correlation function. You see the plateaus to zero as you go to large scales because the galaxies are now sort of isotropic and homogenous. It doesn't matter where you are. Um, so the galaxies don't have any preferred pattern. But as you go to small scales, then obviously galaxies become clusters. The position of a galaxy on small scales is correlated with the positions of other galaxies uh, in the same way that the, the positions of star forming regions within galaxies uh, all correlated uh, with each other um, because of the processes which give rise to these, these things. Um, and so that's why you get an excess in your correlation function on small scales. Um, and then this thing here is just the Baron acoustic oscillation. So it turns out in galaxy clustering, you also have an excess of galaxies separated by about 150 megaparsecs, again, because of the, uh, the way those galaxies form in the universe. Um, and you know, you, you can get something similar for spiral galaxies as well, right? You might have an excess feature uh, at, on the spiral arms. So the, the typical distance of a spiral arm from the center would give you an excess of star forming regions, for instance. Um, okay, so but what if instead of working with galaxy numbers or you know, numbers of sunspots and numbers of star forming regions, what if instead we work by a number normalized by the expected number? And so this is what we usually do in cosmology. We define this thing called the, uh, the, the overdensity. And if you were at Danielle's lecture, I think he would have also defined uh, this right at the end. Um, and so rather than just taking a pure number of galaxies and then computing the data, uh, the, the, the pairs in the data and the pairs in the randoms, we just say, let's instead normalize all of our number of galaxies by the expected number. Uh, and this, has, this is very useful, at least in galaxy clustering, but also in other studies, in that then you can write your correlation function just in terms of this. And if we go back all the way to the beginning, you'll see that this actually looks a lot like a covariance. Um, and so this now is just telling us what is the covariance or the correlation between a field, the, the, the normalized field here and the normalized field at x plus r. Right? So, um, and the reason I've put it in this is because this is going to be very useful when we talk about power spectrum in a little bit. Um, okay, so that's correlation functions, um, and that's just a, a sort of a quick primer on, on what they are and how they relate to covariance and uh, the Gaussian distribution. Um, and so hopefully now I've given you a couple of examples about how you compute this uh, for your favorite data set and in fact why you might want to compute this for your, your favorite data set. Um, you know, because it tells if, if your data set is Gaussian, it tells you everything. Even if your data is not Gaussian, it'll tell you a lot. Um, so now moving on to the power spectrum. So if any of you have ever looked at any sort of frequency analysis or you know <coughs> uh, signals, if you did the first year, lots of undergraduate lab or something, um, if you ever played an instrument, uh, you might have noticed a power spectrum. So uh, the power spectrum basically just tells us where signal is distributed as a function of frequency. Um, so this is for a guitar. Basically, you play a note on a guitar, and you can see that most of the the, the, the frequency is the fundamental frequency of that string. So this here, I'm not sure what note this is, but this could be an A, for instance. Um, and then you get harmonics of that frequency. So you get some, some power is in a higher frequency, a higher harmonic, and then so on and so forth. And so this power spectrum here tells you the, distrib the distribution of, of frequencies when you play that note. And so for a field, which is called wider, uh, this is nothing more than just the amplitude of those Fourier modes. So if you remember Danielle's lecture, uh, you can basically you can take a field, you can Fourier transform it, and you'll get real and complex parts, and then you just square the real parts, square the complex part, put them together, and that is your power spectrum. Um, so this is used a lot in in signal analysis. In fact, you can if you ever if you ever use Audacity, you can literally load in a file uh, or make a recording yourself and compute the power spectrum with a click of a button. Um, but it actually has a wide number of uses in astronomy as well, both radio astronomy, uh, cosmology, and you know any field you can imagine. Um, so this is why we're going over it here. So the way you compute a power spectrum is you can say how much of of of, of a given Fourier mode, how much of a, a given, or what is the power in a in a in a, in a Fourier wave. So, for instance, if my field is perfectly described by a sine wave, then the Fourier transform that is just the delta function, and so my power spectrum is just the delta function. It's one at the frequency of that sine wave. So, for here, for instance, here I've got you know sine wave, and here I've got the power spectrum of that sine wave. 
then if I use a higher frequency sine wave, then again, the Fourier transform is still a delta function, but now the frequency of this is higher, so the power spectrum is now a delta function at a higher frequency. Um, but in this case, my power, all, all of my, my power, all of my uh, fluctuations are at a single frequency. Now what happens if we take a square wave? So again, from Donnell's lecture, um, let's remember that a square wave can be written as a sum of these different Fourier modes. So you can write the square wave down as a function of different sine waves. But then if you take the power spectrum, you'll see that you've got you know, this, this fundamental frequency here, has a lot of power in it, but then you've got another, free, another sine wave with a second frequency, which has another amount of power in it. And so these constants here are no more than the normalization you would give to those Fourier modes when you compute uh, the Fourier transform of a square wave. And so in the same way that you can do this for a square wave, you can do this for any field. You can take your field, you can decompose it into a different Fourier modes, which are different frequencies, and for each frequency you can calculate the power. Um, and so computing the power spectrum of an observable from its Fourier transform tells us the relative distribution in the same way as the correlation function. So if you think about that for a bit, basically I've taken my observable, I'm splitting it up into different Fourier modes and calculating the power spectrum. If I was in that real space, that's no, that's no different. That's from computing the correlation function. If I've got lots of points separated by a very small distance, the frequency between those will be very high, so I'll have lots of power on, high, on, on small scales. And if I've got you know, a correlation between two things on very large scales, then in Fourier space, that's a long wavelength mode, which means I have a lot of power on small scales, on small frequencies, sorry. Um, and so more formally, and this is true regardless of the field you work in, the correlation function is just the Fourier transform of the power spectrum. In the same way that you can calculate the correlation function from the, uh, from the real space observable, and you can calculate the power spectrum from the Fourier space observable, you can calculate the power spectrum and Fourier uh, 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 as just the Fourier transform of the correlation function and vice versa. Um, so this here is for you know, a three-dimensional field. Um, throughout a lot of this talk, I've used the idea of a field which is homogeneous and isotropic. Uh, so this equation becomes even easier, um, and that's here. So here we've just basically said, instead of making this a 3D integral, I've now integrated over the surface of a sphere. So it's homogeneous and isotropic. Uh, so I just put you know, 4 pi k squared delta k as my, as my integral. Um, and you get this. Um, and so this is, your, uh, this is how you transform from the power spectrum of a homogeneous and isotropic field to the correlation function. Um, and so for the example in galaxy clustering, I can take the positions of my galaxies Fourier transform those positions and compute the power spectrum, and it should tell us exactly the same information as the correlation function. However, there are some caveats to that. Um, you know, if, if these two things are completely identical, then what's the point of measuring both? You might as well just measure one. So, you know, in, in galaxy clustering, we've been measuring both for years. Um, and the reason for that is that in a, any real application, you don't have an infinite volume, you don't have an in, in either real space or in Fourier space. So this integral is not, you know, this should go from minus infinity to infinity. That's not true in a real universe. So these two things will have different information because they are looking at different scales. Because you've truncated this, this thing here. Um, and so just to emphasize this and use the notation I used earlier for the correlation function, we could say, you know, so I've got an over density fields. So this is my over density of galaxies now at position R. Um, this is related to the over density in Fourier space by Fourier transform. Um, so, you know, if I can write the correlation function as just the correlation between my over density at x and my over density at x plus r, then the power spectrum is just the correlation in Fourier space of the over density k and the over density of k prime. And this function here is just the direct delta function. And so all this implies is that this is a homogeneous and isotropic field, so k and k prime have to be the same, in, in the same way that, you know, r here is not better. Uh, and this 2 pi cube drops out just because of the convention I've used in all my Fourier transforms. So how can we actually compute the power spectrum, if we want to? Um, and in the same way that we can compute the correlation function using a, a data field and a random field, we can also compute the power spectrum. Um, and so those steps I just showed almost directly translate into how you would calculate the power spectrum 
for your observable. You can just take your data here, right? You can stick it on a grid, and then you can subtract off the randoms, which you also stuck on a grid. So the difference between these two is your, your over density, um, and then you Fourier transform that, and you've got your over density in case. Um, now, as an aside, uh, I thought I'd stick this in almost at the last minute, there are lots of ways you can grid your data. And unlike in real space, where you're just doing a pure sort of count over how many galaxies, uh, how you actually grid this data will affect your Fourier transform. Uh, and um, I'll come on to that a bit later, um, but you know, there's not even one right answer on how to grid the data in the first place. Uh, so here I've got, you know, this is my points, here's my grids. Um, and this textbook here is you know, uh, really very good for looking at the effects of gridding your data in different ways. Um, and so you know, I could assign this point here to this grid cell, or I could say, you know, well, how about I give a weight to each of these four grid cells based on the overlap between this sort of area here and the total size of that cloud. And that's called cloud and cell. You can do triangular shaped cloud, which is another one. So it's, it's basically similar, very similar to cloud, cloud and cell, except now you, you do it for nine, the nine nearest cells. Or you know you can be super fancy, and this is not something I've actually ever tried uh, when I could do the spectrum, but you could, there are reasons why you might want to do this, and that's using a Voronoi tessellation. Um, and one of the reasons you might want to do this is if you've got lots of empty spaces in your um, in your grid, such that when you try and put your particles on your grid, you're left with lots of empty cells. Um, and so different, as I said a minute ago, different methods affect the Fourier transform in different ways, and uh, we'll come on to that in a minute. Uh, so that's just an aside. <coughs> um, ultimately, which one of these you choose, maybe not this one, not about this one, uh, of these uh, could be corrected. Um, you can probably also correct for this, although that's way beyond the, the stuff we'll be talking about today. Um, so once you've got your Fourier transformed over density field, you've taken your data, you've subtracted off the randoms uh, for each grid cell, then we Fourier transform it, and then we just have to iterate over all the modes in K space and compute the amplitudes of those modes. Um, so I'm going to jump right into it and show you a code here, which is for a three dimensional Fourier transform. So you can do this in 1D, it's very simple. Um, you just have to iterate over all those Ks in one dimension and compute the, the amplitude squared. Um, but here, I've done it for three dimensions. Um, so basically you've got here, you've just got a loop over your first K component, here you've got a loop over your second K component, and here you've got a loop over your third K component. So I've got basically just a loop over a 3D grid. So each one of these, one of these inner loops is just a different cell in my 3D grid. For that cell, you then compute the, the amplitude of the K vector. So that's nothing more than you know x squared plus y squared plus z squared times two pi square rooted. That's your that's your frequency, uh, and then you you calculate the what bin that is in, and then you compute your power spectrum. Um, and so I'll get to this bit in a minute, and I'll get to some of these in a minute. But basically, what we're doing then is you're taking the real part of your Fourier transform density field and squaring it, and and taking the imaginary part of your density field Fourier transform squaring it, adding the two together. So fundamentally, what you've got to do is you've got to loop over your grids. And for each cell, let's compute the amplitude squared. However, when you compute the power spectrum, there are quite a few caveats which uh, come into this. And so some important things to note, and these are all the extra bits in this code, are you have a Nyquist frequency, and I'll come on to what that is in a minute. Um, you have shot noise, which is this bit here, which again I'll come on to in a minute. You have this gridding effect, which I was just talking about, so the fact that you've even gridded your data using one of those variety of methods adds in an effect, and again, I'll come on to that in a minute. And then on top of that, you've also got aliasing, which I'll talk about, but is not actually corrected for in this code, um, and you have a window function. And again, I'll come on to that in a minute, um, but that's not corrected for in this code. Um, so, to start with the Nyquist frequency, so this is a fundamental property of a Fourier, or of a discrete Fourier transform, which is done on the grid. Um, and I can't actually remember if uh, Daniel talked about this in his lecture, um, but when you compute a discrete Fourier transform, you basically, you're setting all your data up on a grid, and so the smallest frequency you can look at is the size of each grid cell. You can't look at frequencies below that because you haven't got resolution in your data once it's gridded below that. Um, if you had an infinite you know, resolution grid to put your data on, there would be no, 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 no frequency, but you know, 
because we've got to compute these things and you've got to do a Fourier transform, once you start getting to grid sizes which are you know, high, uh, which, which are, are low, sorry, then you start having problems with Nyquist frequency. Um, and, you know, this is a fundamental limitation of computing nowadays. If you imagine I'm trying to do a three dimensional grid and I want to put down 2,000 cube cells, each one of those has to be a floating point number, 2,000 cubes times four bytes, you're instantly running out of memory. Right, so that's already over 64 gigabytes of RAM or something. Um, so so this, this, is, this is something that will affect any discrete Fourier transform you do. Um, and then because of that, because you've also got grid, you've also got this convolution with the grid uh, cells. So what in effect I'm saying there is I've taken my data, I've gridded it, and so what I've done is I've taken my smooth distribution of data and I've convolved it with a grid, which is, is, this, is this thing here of some size. Right, so my, my gridded data is my true data involved with some grid. Uh, and then when you Fourier transform that, you end up with something which looks a little bit like this, um, at least for the case of a regular sort of cubic grid. Um, so that means the power spectrum that I measure is not the true power spectrum, which is here, but it's actually the power spectrum multiplied by some function. And you know, one of the good things about Fourier transforms is that if you've got a convolution in real space, it becomes a multiplication in Fourier space. Um, and this here is just the Fourier transform of Wx. So here we've basically got pk measured equals pk true times wk. Um, and the good thing about that is that if it's for a regular grid, you can divide through by this factor. Um, and that is in fact what I did go back here. So this is just calculating that factor, and then I do one over that factor, and, and then one over. Um, and this factor p here, will depend on what kind of gridding scheme you used. If you just assign each point to the nearest grid, this is P of one. If I assign each point to a uh, using cloud and cell, so I weight it over the nearest four cells, then this is P of two. And if I do that for a triangular shaped card, so I weight it over the nearest three cells, then this is P of three, and so on. Um, if you were gonna use a Voronoi assassination to try and grid your data, you would not be able to correct it using this. So if you have to do that, then you have to correct that in some other way. Um, so that's the Nyquist frequency and the convolution with the grid. Um, second is aliasing. And this is used and talked about a lot in, uh, in signal analysis and frequency analysis. Uh, you may have heard of it in the context of you know, anti-aliasing of fonts. So if you see a font here and you can look very blurry, uh, that's another kind of aliasing. Um, and the reason this happens is because you've got a grid, you only can only sample down to that smallest frequency, um, the Nyquist frequency. If you then have Fourier modes which are of higher frequency, you can't sample them properly, and so they end up looking like lower frequency modes. And so this is what I've shown here. Um, you know, here is our very high frequency signal in our in our observable. Uh, the points are where I've sampled it, so this is just the grid spacing effectively, and you can see that. I've got more than enough points here to fully reconstruct the signal, so this signal is well sampled. But instead, if for my sampling frequency, so this is my Nyquist frequency now, is just here, then I have nowhere near enough points to you know, reconstruct this very high uh, frequency signal. And so what this ends up looking like is a wave that I can draw through all these points at much lower frequency. And so that means then, if I have high frequency signal in my data, which I'm then putting on a grid of some size, all of the high frequency stuff will end up looking like lower frequency stuff. And it's typically the lowest, the, the, the highest frequency, but above the Nyquist frequency that you can get. Um, and so this is used, yeah, a hell of a lot in a signal uh, processing. And there are tons of ways to anti alias signals, which, to be honest, I don't understand half of them, so I'm not going to talk about them. Um, but one way you can do it for the power spectrum is. Uh, is, is in this paper, so I actually only found this out very recently uh, while I was looking at this. But the way you can describe aliasing is by saying my measured power spectrum at some k is not actually the power spectrum at the k, it's the power spectrum at some k plus all the higher frequency terms, which I haven't measured, um, multiplied by that window function at those higher frequency terms. Uh, and so the way you can get around this is you can correct for this iteratively. So you can measure the power spectrum, you can correct for the window function partially, remeasure the power spectrum, correct for it partially. And if you do that enough times, then you get then this term here effectively goes to one. Um, so that's another thing. So I, yeah, the, the take home here is not 
you should understand anything about this, but that aliasing is a thing, and that uh, it's another thing to bear in mind when you're computing a Fourier transform. And then finally, there is shot noise. So this is now the fact that you've got a finite sampling of your data as opposed to a finite sampling of your grid. So whereas beforehand we had um, a grid which has got some width, now we also have some data which is not you know, fully sampling the underlying distribution. Um, and this is called shot noise. And when you propagate this through into a power spectrum, this actually is just a constant white noise term in your power spectrum. So it's just a flat, constant power. Um, so in terms of galaxy catalogs, the shot noise is just how many galaxies we have. What we really want to know is the underlying distribution of galaxies, but we can only measure some subsample of those, like the brightest, the reddest, the ones right in the center of their halos. And so that then means that we haven't fully sampled the underlying distribution in real space, and so there's some white noise in our power spectrum. And this is highlighted here. Uh, so this is a plot actually from STSS3, I think, that's learned used by Survey 3. Um, so the power spectrum you measure from that set of galaxies is given by this very thin line here. Uh, so this is the measured power spectrum. And this has a whole bunch of effects in it that I just explained. So you have shot noise, which is this constant white noise term. Right? And then you've also got gridding effects on small scales where you get close to the micro frequency, uh, which is where this, this dashed line turns over here. Um, so as you get, this is a Nyquist frequency here. As you get close to the Nyquist frequency, you get these gridding effects, which can involve your power spectrum. So you can correct for both of those, and then you can get back to this, this true underlying power spectrum here. Okay, so that, uh, that is an overview of the power spectrum, um, and some of the things that happen when you do Fourier transforms. So all of these things are not unique to galaxy clustering, and they're not even unique to power spectrum. These are, these are things that happen when you take the Fourier transform of a density field. Um, however, something that is unique to the, when you start actually computing the power spectrum um, of your density field uh, is the window function. And so, it, as I talked about earlier, you have this integral constraint in your, in your correlation function, which means that you can't, you know, you can't measure correlations larger than this. Right? I don't have any galaxies out here, I don't have any galaxies out here, so I can't measure correlations on scales which are larger than the size of my survey mask and the density that I'm calculating is just the average of the points inside the survey mask. It might not be the true density of the universe. Um, you know, for instance, if this hatch is small enough, I could be sampling a bit in the universe which we've got tons of galaxies in it. Uh, but the overlay doesn't have any. So. Um, so that's the integral constraint in real space. And then this also has an effect when you do the Fourier transform and when you look in Fourier space at the power spectrum. So another way of writing this down, this mask, is I'm basically Beforehand, I was convolving the density by some window function. Now, in real space, I'm just taking my density field and multiplying it by some window function. Right? So, out here, my measured density field is zero, not because the true density field is zero, but because my window function is zero. I have no data there, so this is zero. Um, in some patches in this survey, you know, you might have bits where you've got some data, but you missed a few redshifts, or you didn't observe all the galaxies you meant to, or you didn't, you, yeah, right, you didn't observe all the galaxies that were there, and so you can see some of these artifacts here, right? So there's a few stripes here, there's a cross here, right? So these are bits of the data which are partially observed. Then this window function here would be some weight which is up to one. You know, I've observed 50% of the data that I could observe, so this is now 0.5. So in real space, this survey mask is very easy to model, but in Fourier space, just as a convolution in Fourier space becomes a multiplication, a multiplication in real space becomes a convolution. And so this is a problem for the power spectrum because when I try and measure the power spectrum, I'm not measuring the true power spectrum on large scales. I'm measuring the power spectrum convolved by this window. Um, and that's what I show here. So here you've got you know, your true power spectrum is in red. Um, and then, so this is for the galaxy field um, from the simulation, I think. And then this white point here are the power spectrum you'd measure once the, you've taken into account the fact you've got a survey mask. And so what you're doing is this convolution pulls the power down on large scales, because you just can't measure those modes there, and then convolves the power in such a way that some of the power on these large scales is moved to small scales. Um, and so that's the effect of a window function. So then all those effects roll into the power spectrum. So again, you might ask the question of, well, this power spectrum seems like a lot trickier to calculate than the correlation function. Why on earth would I even bother computing the power spectrum? And the answer there is that they don't necessarily have all the same information. 
And the real kicker is that if you want to compute the correlation function, you've got to sum over all of your galaxies. If you now say I've got a million galaxies and I want to compute all possible pairs, that's now a million squares operations you have to do. Whereas if you're putting them with electronic grids, if you're transforming it and computing the power spectrum, that's many orders of magnitude faster. Um, so that's why you may want to compute the power spectrum instead of the correlation function. Uh, and in fact, you know, when a lot of the work I do, I compute the power spectrum instead of the correlation function purely because it's just a lot quicker to calculate. And even though there's more of these effects, they can all be, or nearly all be, uh, accounted for in some way. So now we can go full circle back to the original point, which is that if we can measure the correlation function of power spectrum of our field, and if it's Gaussian, we then know everything about the field. Um, and so one way to wrap sort of all this round is we say, okay, so what if we want to generate a simulation where we know the field is Gaussian, um, how would we go about doing that? Well, you can say, if I know the power spectrum or the correlation function, I now know everything about my field. So I can just say, this is a Gaussian distribution where my observable is my x now, my power spectrum is now my covariance, and I can just generate points from that distribution. Uh, and this is exactly what we do for galaxy simulations. You say, how do I set up a bunch of initial density perturbations like in my, in my simulation? Well, we just take some power spectrum, which is based on the room universe, um, and you say, now let's generate a bunch of, uh, a bunch of over densities. Um, and you know, there's good reason to think that this is valid for the real universe. There's a good reason to think that the universe is actually Gaussian um, due to you know, arguments for inflation. Um, and also the fact, you know, this was measured by Planck uh, recently. There's very little primordial non-Gaussianity in the universe. Planck measured the fact that there's the initial conditions of the universe from the CMB are very Gaussian. Um, and ultimately, this all drops out from the fact that you have the central limit theorem. So given enough perturbations, you'll get a Gaussian distribution. Um, so then that is, in fact, what we do in simulations. So here I've just set up some initial like density perturbations uh, drawn from this Gaussian distribution here with some input power spectrum, and then you can evolve that over time, and you end up with your beautiful simulation that you've seen countless times when the SU2 group here has given a talk. So, um, so now that's Gaussians and how they relate to covariance. Then we've gone through how covariance relates to correlations and the correlation function, and how you might want to estimate this. Uh, then this is the power spectrum. So this is intrinsically related to the correlation function. Um, you know, you can estimate this using a grid, which you Fourier transform. Uh, and we've gone over some of the important caveats if you want to do that. Um, and now we can go and say, well, what's beyond this? Um, right at the end. So uh, throughout this talk, I've been you know, talking about fields which are isotropic, in that it doesn't matter which direction you look in and homogeneous in that it doesn't matter where you are. So if I stand here or I stand here and observe my universe, they're the same. Um, but what if that's not true? What if your universe or your observable is no longer isotropic? Well, then you can't really say my correlation function is just a function of the separation between two points. Instead, your correlation function, and this is true of any correlation function, still not necessarily galaxy clustering, becomes a function of the separation between those two points and also the angle at which you're looking at those points. Because an observer looking in this direction is no longer the same as an observer looking in this direction. Um, so this mu here is just the cosine of theta here. And so now your correlation function has to be written in terms of r and mu. Um, but you can use, still use the same estimator. You can now say, well, how many pairs of galaxies do I have separated by r and mu? So I now have, you know, instead of just bins in r, I now have bins in r and mu. So it's a 2D uh, function. And what we commonly do, commonly do in large-scale structure, but you can, it doesn't just apply to large-scale structure, is you can then uh, convert these back to just functions of R uh, using uh, multipole decomposition. Um, so that's just saying, you know, I've taken my 2D function. These are the Legendre polynomials. So these are just well-known functions. Um, I never remember them, but you have to look them up on Wikipedia. Right. Um, it's just, I think the first one is one, the second one is like three mu squared plus one. Right. It's just a function of mu. Um, so you integrate that and you get back the, the multipoles. Um, and this is similar in essence, to what's done when you do a spherical harmonic decomposition as well, um, which you might as well know about in you know, quantum mechanics and if you've ever done CMB work. Um, and the, where this comes into play in observations of our universe is not that the universe is not isotropic. The cosmological principle, you know, uh, if, if it's to be believed, says the universe should be statistically homogeneous and isotropic. 
but our observation of the universe aren't. And that's intrinsically linked to the fact that when we calculate the distance to a galaxy, we use a redshift, which is not a perfect proxy for distance. It's also got a velocity in there. You might have lensing in there as well. Um, and all these things add up um, to mean that the signal we observe is not isotropic anymore. And so this is done extremely frequently now in large-scale structure uh, measurements um, instead of just assuming that they're isotropic. Um, so that's one way you can extend this work. You can, you can look at you know, correlations not just as a function of distance, but as a function of angle. Um, or, you know, or and on top of this, you can then look at uh, higher order correlation functions. So for a Gaussian field, the two-point correlation function and two-point power, or the power spectra describe everything. Right? But if you've got a non-Gaussian field, there can be up to infinite endpoint correlation functions. And you know, a very simple one is if instead of a Gaussian field, you have a log normal field. You know, as we've shown, the log normal field actually has an infinite number of endpoint functions. It's nowhere near as nice as a Gaussian, and you would need an infinite number of those endpoint functions to completely describe it. Um, or you can look at you know, the phases. So in the power spectrum, we looked at the amplitude of those Fourier modes. Uh, for a Gaussian distribution, the phases are random. There's no correlation between them. But for non-Gaussian distributions, there can be correlations between phases as well. Um, and so these higher order functions uh, you know, can be written in very similar ways to the power spectrum and correlation function. But now instead of looking at you know, our observable at some location and our observable at another location and seeing how those two things are correlated, we now look at how three different locations are correlated with respect to each other. So in terms of sunspots or you know, galaxy clustering or star forming regions in the galaxy, instead of drawing lines, and saying, what's the chance of me finding something at either end? You now throw down triangles and say, what's the chance of me finding an object here and here and here? Similar to anything. Uh, and then you can do this for you know, different triangle configurations in the same way that you can do this for different lengths of line. Um, so you can do that in real space, and you get the three-point correlation function. You can do this in Fourier space and get something that's called the bispectrum. Um, and you know, there's an infinite number of these points, so you can, in fact, you can go to even higher order. And you can do four point functions. So now this is the four point correlation function. So now I'm looking at different sort of uh, four sided shapes of different sizes and different lengths and different angles. So this would be a trapezia and parallelograms and stuff. Um, and you can do it again in real space and Fourier space. And in Fourier space, this is often called the tri spectrum. And these things uh, haven't been used too much in galaxy clustering uh, until quite recently. Um, obviously, you know. Three and four point functions have been known about for years, and you can find them again in People's 1980 book. He talked a lot about these. Um, actually, measurements of these have only just started coming out. Um, the CMB is way ahead in terms of measuring the bi spectrum, and so we've been doing that for quite a while now. Uh, and in fact, there's been some work on looking at the tri spectrum in the CMB. Um, and recently, especially with the latest release of Galaxy surveys, the bi spectrum has been shown, uh, has been measured quite a lot. And even though our universe may have started off as Gaussian, and there's good reason to believe that it's Gaussian, gravitational evolution, nonlinear equations will introduce higher order clustering and higher order correlation between these things. And that's true, you know, for most sort of differential equations you can say, oh, this is also true in, in, in galaxies and, you know, sunspots and stuff. Okay, so this is the end. Um, for anyone who wants some further, further reading, I uh, put a few. Uh, references in the talk, but um, there's a few textbooks out there which are sort of fundamental to this, and I've mentioned this one a couple of times, this is People's 1980 book, and if you want to know anything about correlation functions or power spectra, um, this really is the go-to um, descriptor at uh, a very sort of basic level of what a correlation function is. Um, similarly, there's this uh, thing here which, despite its name, is actually very good at looking uh, for Fourier transforms and sort of the effects of Fourier transforms. Uh, when you grid data. So this is using you know, particles, but these particles can be anything. It could be whatever you want it to be. And, and the work in here is uh, transferable. Um, the estimator that I use for the correlation function, this sort of dd minus 2dr plus rr over rr, uh, actually comes from this paper. And again, this is all done in the context of large scale structure, but that estimator is general. You could use that for any observable you wanted to use it for uh, in astrophysics. And similarly, there's a paper from the power spectrum, um, which again is general enough that you can apply this to any observable. So if you're ever sort of interested in computing the correlation function or the power spectrum, 
of your data set, then these things will give you a good uh, start. So, thanks. Thanks, oh, Cullen. I don't need that. That's right. uh, any immediate questions for Cullen? Uh, I've got one or two, but I encourage students to uh, ask something if they're curious. I'm sure some of this stuff is uh, quite new to uh, most of you, actually. Okay, nods. Well, they clearly understood it. <laughs> is there anything intuitive you'd say you get out of, uh, well, uh, three-point correlation functions? Because that's kind of the classic thing. They're quite hard to look at and intuitively get information from. Yes. So, in, yeah, it's 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 almost it's very tricky because you know we can't really visualize correlations between three points in the same way we can as two points. But I think now, I mean, at least in the large scale structure, the two point functions have been mined dry. They've yeah. been they've been observed now for nearly forty years. So, if you want to really get a good insight into sort of physical processes that give rise to non Gaussian oh. distribution then that's what you need to look at. And these things occur all throughout nature, right? There's these bispectral and trispectral and higher order functions occur whenever, nearly whenever you've got any partial nonlinear differential equations going on. So this would be true for galaxy formation, this would be true for large scale structure. Um, and so if you really want to get a handle on those and the physical processes driving these, these things, then you have to start looking beyond galaxy Okay. I guess the reason kind of Planck got there first is they're kind of cheating. That's really two D data they're using. That's, well, yeah. So first of all, yeah, they're only looking at you the know, a two D map on the sky, so it's, it's the inside of a sphere on this, yeah. right? And so you're looking at angular positions. But also for the bispectral, it's very simple because the universe has only just started in the CMB. The amount of time for these nonlinear processes to have occurred is very small. So the fields, the underlying density, which is very linear still. Um, so they were very quick to measure the power spectrum and understand the power spectrum. And so the next step was to do the bispectrum, and that's why they're way ahead of us. We spent a lot longer trying to understand, you know, nonlinear effects in the two-point functions, as opposed to moving on to higher-order statistics. Well, I guess that's right. The boss folk and eBoss people have started mining uh, these higher-order yeah. statistics. Now. Yeah. And so in the future, I mean, there's going to be a lot of work on looking at the bispectrum um, in eBoss and and foremost and Desi, um, because that's where a lot of the new information is going to come. From. And in terms of cosmology, what's like the interesting cosmology that would be the first thing to drop out of uh, the bi spectrum and the tri spectrum? What so, the what really good. For, I guess? Well, in terms of cosmology, the thing the bi spectrum is very, very good for is disentangling uh, the effects of galaxy bias. Um, so, in the power spectrum, at least in, you know, when, when we measure the power spectrum, you've basically got a function which is on linear scale is purely dependent on the galaxy bias. Whereas with bi spectrum, because you're no longer looking at just separation between two, two points, you're looking at the separation between, well, on the vertices of triangles, you can that that means that the bias dependence of that thing is no longer uh, as uh, purely on, on those scales. So if you combine the two, then you effectively you cancel out by the bias in some way. So for testing gravity, uh, these are very useful. Um, gravity, by definition, will give rise to a bi spectrum because of a set of nonlinear partial differential equations. Um, so that's where a lot of the work is, is, is if you want to test GR and you want to test modified theory of gravity, you, nowadays you need to measure the bias spectrum. Okay. Oh, um, yes, yeah. How do you uh, calculate the uncertainty of uh, cross, uh, the cross correlation function and also power spectrum? So yes, yeah, so this is, uh, this, well, so you can kind of let's see this, if I, I think I've got this one, somewhere in here. There's an equation which is the power spectrum. Okay, let's do. So here we have the correlation function, which is just the density field at x and the density field at x plus r. So now you can say, well, what is the covariance of my correlation? It's almost the covariance of my covariance. And you can imagine a very similar equation here, but now I've got my higher order thing whatever you simply want to use there. And here I've got a correlation function, so here is now psi and here is now psi. And so, you know, the astute among you may notice that now I've basically said, now substitute psi here, I've now got delta x, delta x plus r, delta x2, delta x2 plus r2. So now it's just a four point function. So when you want to calculate the error on these, the way you do it theoretically is you end up with, and you basically you can, you can write your covariance for this 
in the same way you write the coherence of the density fields, you substitute in this term and you get some combination of 2 point, 3 point, and 4 point correlation functions. The same is true for the power spectrum. So if you do it for the power spectrum, you end up with some combination of power spectra, bi spectra, and tri spectra. So that's the theoretical methods. However, theoretically modeling the power spectrum for you know, your observable, whether it's sunspots or gas clustering or whatever, is tricky. Computing the bi spectrum and tri spectrum theoretically is super tricky. So instead, what we tend to do is we just take a bunch of simulations. We will generate you know, 500 galaxy simulations. For each of those simulations, we'll compute this, and then we'll just look at the variance across the simulations. So that shows how horrific it is if that's the easier yeah. solution. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, just run thousands of simulations. Yeah. Yeah. So we, yeah, we run, you know, for BOSS and for current surveys, we run on the order of a thousand dark matter simulations uh, of some suitably high, but not too high resolution, so they can actually be done in some reasonable time frame. And then we pop them with galaxies, compute the path spectrum correlation function, and then we just average over all those. Damn. Can you explain why the naive data over random estimator is biased, or should I just read that data? Well, uh, this, so in fact, any estimator of the correlation function will be biased. This, uh, wait, I'm going to this, uh, Kasai, uh, this, this data data over random random is not, um, it is biased. And then the data data minus 2DR plus RR, so this one here, uh, is also biased still. So, so this one improves over the previous estimator, which is just data over random, in that it's got a better variance. It's got better variance properties. The intrinsic variance of this estimator is better. However, both of them are biased because you're estimating the mean number of, of the observable from your data. So in terms of a galaxy um, survey, and mis mistakenly, I should have put a, uh, you know, this bit. I should have put the, the density field here, but you know, if you're estimating the density just from this patch here, it doesn't matter which estimator you use for the correlation function, your estimator of the mean is not necessarily going to be the same as the mean across the whole simulation. Um, and that gives rise to the bias in the correlation function, and it gives rise to the window function in the pass spectrum. Okay, thanks. Any, any final questions? Right, if not, let's thank uh, Colin again. Cheers.